I'll be your facilitator this evening, and in just a moment, I'm going to hand the microphone off to Carl Etnayer, who is the president of the council. But before I do that, just a quick piece of housekeeping. The first is, if you're looking for a bathroom, there's a bathroom towards the kitchen and then to your right, down that hall, that's one bathroom, and there are more bathrooms back where you came from, near the entrance, and you can find them that way if you need to. Uh, still plenty of food, so if you are hungry, please have some more seltzer juice over in the sideboard. Um, this evening, what's that? Oh. She wasn't talking to me. Oh boy. Uh, uh, I just handed out playing cards. Please hang on to your playing card. It'll become relevant soon. Uh, but until then, uh, I want to hand this off to Carl at night and Carl. Oh, apparently not. No. Just one, one quick thing to say. We are going to do uh, some giveaways for all anyone here at the end of the night. We have four $25 co-op gift cards to give away, so stick around to the end, and we will announce the winners then. Hey, <laughs> so most microphones, the way they work is you, like, you're almost consuming them, and this one, if I do that, it's just going to blow our minds. So, Carl, be careful. Thank you, Nathan. And thank you to all of you who've come out here tonight. Thank you to the wonderful food prep staff at Hunger Mountain that have made this food for us. Thank you to our community relations team that have put this together uh, to from the staff side to the numerous council members who have worked on it. Uh, and I'll let you, even in just a moment, tell about who they are. And thanks to our, our presenters who will be introduced uh, shortly. Uh, I'm so glad to have us get together in what has been an annual gathering that was interrupted by COVID. And uh, last year uh, was not all in person like this. Uh, now we're together in person again. I'm so glad that we're talking about resilience, uh, which is a theme dear to my heart, and I don't have to sell this crowd on that, so I won't. This event is hosted by our council. Probably all you know that I, I've been talking to people outside the area for a while now, and every time I say the Hunger Mountain Council, they say, the, the what? Uh, so it's a board. And almost all of our 10-person board is here today. Let's, uh, let's have everybody stand up and, and say hi. Eva, Eva Schechtman. Yeah. Jeff, why don't you hold the applause till, till the end, um, <laughs> except for Eva, too late. Uh, Jeff Roberts, where's Jeff? There's Jeff back there. Could you stand up so people can see you better? No. Okay. <laughs> Lauren Antler, where's Lauren? Oh, thought she was here. Okay. Uh, Devora, Jonas, thank you. Catherine Lothar, where's Catherine? Thank you, Catherine. Ashley Muscarella. Hey, hey, thank you. And anyone I missed on the council here? Okay, now you, now you can applaud them all, please. <laughs> and, and Eva, who was a gang that, be, that you led on the council putting this together, please? Okay, so uh, Lauren Hamlin, um, Ashley. Uh, Right. Um, Great team. Yes. Thank you. Could more. I'd like to join this illustrious group. There are people who cycle off of it, and the regular elections are in November in connection with the annual meeting. So please talk to any of us. We have things like this in front of us where we're sitting. I think most of us uh, will be around tonight. Talk to us, and uh, I'd love to have some more blood on the council. Thanks. So we are graced this evening by Katie Trouts of Montpelier Live, by Lali uh, well, the voice of Lalitha Malawaganam, who is a community member, 
by Allison Levin, Community Harvest of Central Vermont, and Teresa Murray Clausen, a community organizer. So four people who are going to share with us some of their stories and reflections about the flooding and resilience after the flood. And then we're going to ask you all to spend some time together at your tables discussing the following prompts. I'm just going to read them now so that they're in your, in your head. And they're also on a piece of paper on your table. What is resiliency in a challenged environment? What would it look like for our communities to become more resilient? And what is the co-op's role in weaving that fabric? So this is an opportunity for the co-op council to hear from the community, hear your creativity, hear your experiences, hear how the co-op might play a role as a, a player in the resiliency, you know, in advancing resiliency in the community. Um, one of the things that I love about tonight is that, to me, this is an example of the co-op uh, practicing and exhibiting a way that it's thinking of itself as a member of the community and thinking about how else can the community, how else can the co-op build community, bring people together, uh, hold interesting conversations, and then maybe advance those in the co-op's own actions. So, exciting evening. Uh, Katie Trouts is gonna speak first. Then we have a recording of Lalita, who could not be here this evening. Allison will be third, and then Teresa Murray Clausen will close this out. I'm gonna hand it off to Katie Trouts. Thanks, Nathan. And uh, thanks to the co-op for having this discussion. I think it's really important that we keep these conversations live in our community and keep working towards um, a better future. So uh, the day before the flood, I think many of you know our story. So I will try to keep it short. But I do get really involved because I go through my memories of what happened, and it just starts to unfold. And a part of kind of recovering and resilience, I, I believe, is sharing stories and being able to process together what has happened in our community. So um, I'll start the day before the flood. Uh, well, I'll start a few months before that. I took the job as executive director at Montpelier Live uh, less than a year before the flood happened, officially the February before July. Um, so my impression of what our organization would be doing um, was revitalization work as a partner to the city, and we're a nonprofit. Um, that is not a city department. Montpelier Live is a nonprofit that partners with the city on beautification, events, hosting events like July 3rd um, and various others, marketing uh, for Montpelier, so working with the city on, on marketing um, to draw people here and tourists, uh, and economic vitality, so supporting businesses. So um, that's kind of in a normal year, the projects we would be working on, and I had worked along side Dan Groberg for um, a year and a half or so before that as the events coordinator. Uh, the day before the flood, I was called into the city manager's office and we had an emergency planning meeting because we were alerted that there, it was probable that our town would be flooding with all the precipitation. Um, and he mentioned that maybe a good role for Montpelier Alive would be to help coordinate volunteers. Uh, for the downtown and for the businesses that I'm working with, I have trust with, um, I'm learning about in my new to the job <laughs> role. But uh, it made a lot of sense to me to take on that role also because of my personality, being quite networked into the community and um, feeling like we could rally people to help. I did not know the magnitude <laughs> of uh, what the flood would look like. and. Um, and had a somewhat sleepless night <laughs> thinking about this role. But the next day was joined early on by the city parks director, Alec Ellsworth, and Peter Walk, who um, had been a member of the Navy and had emergency response experience and um, knew some systems that would be really essential uh, to being able to get volunteers out in the community in an organized way. So we came up with the idea of the hub being a physical location once the waters receded that people could come to request help and we'd be able to, again, in an organized way, get people out there um, in those places of need. I don't think any of us knew the magnitude of the flood until we got down there and um, that morning and uh, wait, literally waited uh, on the spot, near the spot where we were to set up the tents. 
um, waited for those waters to recede and you know they were four feet high in the first levels. Um, so taking that all in, but at the same time, sending messages out, that's something Montpelier Alive does a lot, is communications with the community, with the businesses. So sending messages out that we needed volunteers. And I just can't, um, I just can't tell you enough you know, how grateful we were, even in those first hours, there are volunteers that just flooded our, our area just ready to go, where do we go? Well, we had to figure out where that need was. So the Montpelier Youth Conservation Corps um, flew into action, um, being at Alex's side the whole time, um, and they were able to kind of canvas the downtown as those waters receded and uh, talk to business owners with me, with Carolyn, uh, to figure out what the need was. So that went on, but we also found out that the food pantry had flooded. Um, that some other essential resources area places had flooded and we thought this would be a really good location to be able to house some of those entities and offer those resources. So um, we were able to very quickly pop up a food pantry um, and people were donating goods. If they couldn't volunteer and dig out basements, they came and brought their food to share. Um, and uh, at that time, I will say Alec and Peter kind of were able to assess more of the needs. I had to pivot a little bit because there was this other, there were a couple of other um, very important things to address like getting resources like uh, recovery resources to businesses right away and doing research on, you know, how can businesses uh, find like out what to do next, like insurance and you know, is FEMA gonna help them? There were a lot of lingering questions. So I had to work on that and I also realized I had to be fundraising right away. And these are all things that Montpelier Alive as a nonprofit were able to be nimble with and quick with and pop up fundraising platform, um, Google online, all these resources with our partners that we already had across Vermont and beyond other nonprofits. So while I was doing that, they started coordinating, and we'll learn more about this through the um, conversation, coordinating the uh, food and the free food that was offered at the hub. So that was another thing that was happening at the hub. Um, and then we had these volunteer groups calling in from across the nation saying, we would like to volunteer. Can we set up a tent at your volunteer hub, our own tent, and um, offer what we can offer from that location? So the hub just kind of grew and grew to meet those community needs as they arose. It, was, um, it seemed like a really great way to address this, uh, address all the issues that were uh, that started to come into play. Um, it was really an incredible thing, the way that the hub kind of um, grew its footprint and involved so, so many different people. Um, and over the next couple of weeks, uh, the volunteer hub remained very active. And I think that many of you are aware that we took in almost 4,000 volunteers. Uh, and deployed them, deployed them to uh, up to 800 locations or different tasks across town. I think there were maybe 400 places that were flooded, but 800 different tasks that had to be done in all of these places. So um, that's really an incredible proof that um, our community shows up. I mean, there are like 8,000 people who live in this community, and I'm not saying all the volunteers were from this community, but if you just think about that, 4,000 people swooping in, um, it's just incredible, the participation. And then on multiple levels with the donations of food, the cooking of food, the um, donation of goods, like we had couch, we have couches at the Volunteer Hub. People could choose a couch and <laughs> take it home. Um, so. That was excellent. The other thing Montpelier Alive was able to do once that hub was kind of like working on its own um, is raise this money. We partnered with the Montpelier Foundation and were able to have a much higher impact. And um, we raised over $2.6 million in a couple months. And we granted all of that out very quickly 
to the businesses um, because in our downtown, there were, I believe, 90 buildings that were very impacted by flooding, like physically impacted by flooding. And just the way that the flood worked, you know, it's like a bathtub. It just filled in our downtown and they just happened to be, I'm not saying all, we're gonna talk about this, but mostly businesses. And we needed that core center to be resilient, to come back quickly for kind of the vitality of our downtown. So in Montpelier Live, working with businesses, we granted those funds out to the businesses very quickly to get them back on their feet. And without that, there was nothing. FEMA does not help businesses. They offer SBA loans um, only. And I can say that a lot of businesses were kind of uh, traumatized by their experiences with COVID loans. And they had already taken out hundreds of thousands of dollars in, since Irene, and they were still paying those off. So to have to take another loan was not something that a lot of businesses wanted or were willing to do. So uh, there was the state BGAP funds that came into play, but it was quite a while before those funds trickled down. Um, and then what we tried to do is fill the gaps between funding from various entities. We were able to fill those gaps with grant funds as it was needed, knowing what was needed by being here on the ground doing that work. So um, that was Montpelier Alive's role, and also to help uh, host those public forums. And hopefully many of you came to those, and thank you for being present. And out of that, um, we partnered uh, with the city and the Montpelier Foundation to help create the Commission for Recovery and Resilience. And in that way, we're trying to stay involved in the conversation and at the table um, with the projects that move us towards being a more resilient place, more co resilient community in the long term. So that's in a nutshell our response and what we plan to be doing ongoing. Um, and I work closely with the city and we're also having those conversations internally. And um, I just really hope that Montpelier Alive can continue to help uh, build the resiliency and, and be a player you know, in that picture as it unfolds. Um, I will pass the mic on now, but I really look forward to talking with you all in a little bit. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> and in case any of you want you know, a moment with Katie, when we're having the discussions after the presentations, the presenters will be circulating and checking in with groups and sort of gathering what, uh, impressions from what you're sharing. Uh, next up, we have the voice of Lalita. And thanks to Jess for being the tech whiz on this one. Welcome to the Border Town Podcast, the Flood Series. On July 11th, 2023, a state of disaster was declared throughout Vermont as intense and widespread rainfall dropped up to eight inches of water over a 38-hour period. This led to catastrophic flooding throughout the state and left the entire downtown of the capital city, Montpelier, underwater. The Border Town Flood Series will introduce you to some of the small businesses, community members, and government officials, anyone in the community that is collectively experiencing this disaster. Today we welcome Lalitha Mylwaganum, Lalitha led the charge in organizing the volunteer-run food center that fed hundreds of people during the first several weeks of this disaster. Start, and we always start with an introduction, however you'd like to introduce yourself. Um, my name is Lalitha Mailwaganam. Uh, I'm originally from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I moved here to Montpelier in 2002. I uh, remember when I was walking downtown with a cart uh, full of food um, to give to workers, volunteers. It was very surreal. It felt like to me that I was walking in a war zone because all the debris was piled up. It was quiet, mm. but there were people inside the building working. And I poked my head inside one of the buildings. Nobody's there or some... Some buildings, there were people, call them out, give them food and water. 
it was so surreal. Mm. It was like in the movies, you know, war-torn yeah. town. It's yeah. just unbelievable. So you ended up organizing some food. So when you first went down there, you just said, well, people need food. I guess I'll pack some up and bring it down. Well, not really. The first week I saw some trucks were here mm. and um, some organization were here feeding food. And then the following week, uh, I noticed there was nobody doing it. I think it, it's common, like when, when a crisis happened, everybody comes the first week, mm. and then the second week, there's nobody around. Yeah. So what I did on um, uh, Sunday was, I contacted Alec Ellingsworth um, and asked him, if you could give me a letter writing to Costco for donations, uh, they, they would be more than happy to give me some donations. Mm. So you wrote me a letter, I got some chicken, 40 pounds of chicken, and then donated water and some chips. So on Monday, I, with my family, uh, we decided to do a cookout and people were coming in. I couldn't keep up. I didn't realize the extent of uh, people mm. were working, the workers and everything. So uh, when I wrapped up on Monday, Alec told me that um, there's nobody else coming to town to feed people. If he asked me if I would be interested in doing it again. <laughs> and this was like 3 o'clock. After you just kind of had an exhausting yeah. time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I was like, all right, um, let me reach out to some people. If I get enough donors and volunteers, because it's hard for me to do by myself. Mm -hmm. So I said, let me reach out. If I get money, if I get good reception, I'll be back. Mm. And that night, I posted on Facebook, reaching out to all my friends. Everybody is so busy doing work, they forgot to eat. Food is very important, nourishment. If you want to keep working, you know, mentally, physically, you need food. So we were happy to do that, that service. We call it Seva service to everybody. We don't discriminate. Um, I want to ask you, you said you called, the, the, the work you were doing, you said we call it seva? Seva. Can you explain that a little bit? Seva uh, in Hinduism or Buddhism is called um, selfless service. Uh, so you help people uh, serve everyone in need. It could be in form of help, uh, food, not necessarily cash, but you give service. You use your energy and your talent to provide help. Yeah. And I know you said, and I read a Facebook post, you said that it leads towards the accumulation of dharma. Is that dharma, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Doing good work, you know, like everybody, you know, you donate and everything, you, you do good work, you get good things. I think that's going to, we talk about a resilient future, right? I think that's a very big component of that resilient future, is that selfless service. Selfless service, yeah. yeah. No recognition, no award. <laughs> yeah. You just do it. The amount of people that did selfless service, it was beautiful. We became one doing everything. It was really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know it's selfless, but I am grateful for your <laughs> filling that role. Uh, sadly, Lalita could, Lalita could not join us this evening, but wonderful to hear her voice and her narrative. There's a more extensive interview on the... Border Town Podcast. Thank you very much, Carl. Okay, Allison. Thanks, Nathan. Great. So, to wanted to add a little, another element of the story that's already been mentioned, some pieces of. So, I'm from Community Harvest of Central Vermont. Many of you know the work of our organization. We're one of the regional gleaning programs um, here in the central part of the state, and we partner with other gleaning programs around the state to utilize surplus from local farms with the help of volunteers to then send to food shelves, senior meal programs and other organizations feeding people with limited access. So um, our work um, works with 50 to 100 farms each season to recover their surplus with three to 400 volunteers that go out into the fields with us or help with deliveries or other um, work in that way. And then we donate to about 30 organizations here in Washington County that are receiving the food. So in Montpelier, that includes the Montpelier Food Pantry, which is our biggest recipient organization, um, which I'll talk about more in a second, and other organizations 
other organizations like the uh, community, all the community meals, or many of them here, um, and other organizations like Another Way and Family Center Washington County, for example, uh, about five or six organizations right in the city um, that we partner with along with all the others around the county. Um, so our work is really uh, to be that connector between um, the for-profit food system and the charitable food system, helping to make sure that everyone has access to the local food. And we're, um, our ability to do that work is um, only possible because we're very nimble and adaptable. And so in situations like the flooding, that was just part of what we do. Um, so we were able to um, you know, continue to do our normal work and we'll get into more details about that. So um, with the, all the, the work that we did, just a little bit more about organization that you may be familiar with, those of you who've been involved, and many of you are involved in our work, so I appreciate that. Um, last season, um, we're still feeling the effects of that um, season because it wasn't just the flooding, it was the moisture that we continued to have after that. And But we're luckily, we're able to donate over 100,000 pounds throughout the season last year, which was um, quite a feat, even though we weren't out in the fields very much. Um, so again, that um, was possible because of our um, support of the community and the facility that we have been able to create um, now that we've been work doing this work for about 10 years. Um, and the van you may have seen around, driving around in the community. So with those resources, we're able to be really nimble and adaptable. And so that's what we did when uh, COVID hit. We just kept making sure food was getting to people. And so, um, when we got to, um, you know, last summer, we were doing our normal work, um, you know, keeping an eye out on what was happening. But that Monday, we just um, were like, well, uh, we need to get the vehicles where we can keep doing our work as long as possible and collecting this food. Normally, our distribution day is on Tuesday. So we had um, almost a full cooler worth of all the food that we collect through the week. So Monday morning, it was like, Let's make sure the pickup truck can get out so I can keep getting food as long as possible, knowing that even if we couldn't get it out right away, it was gonna be needed pretty soon. So we continued to collect red hand bread from the bakery and other things that we do on Mondays. And by the end of the day, we had cooler full of food ready, standing by for whatever was coming next. Obviously by that time, we didn't really know how the evening was gonna go, but um, we did know that um, it was good we got the truck out because it couldn't get home. So once I walked home, I was like, well, we'll see what happens in the morning. Um, but we were able to, within two days, um, when the Montpelier Food Pantry created their pop-up um, at the hub, um, we had a van full of food that we were able to bring them. We had collected and partnered with some of other our recipient organizations and farms and gotten coolers and ice from Farmers to You. So along with the food, we were able to distribute the coolers and the ice that they needed so that they had um, everything you know, along with any of the donations. Other people were able to give canned food. They had lots of fresh stuff as well um, as they normally would um, on a given Tuesday. Um, this Thursday, they were able to give out that food and then whatever they might have left, we were able to take all of it back um, or and the ice and the coolers and put it in our space and store anything they needed, any other donations they needed that needed cold storage um, and we did the storage for them for as long as they needed it so all through the summer into the fall with their temporary location on Berry Street they didn't have a lot of storage so we were able to help store um, anything they needed in our facility because um, we had a lot of capacity for that and many times you know deliver it to them as they needed it um, and we were continuing along with the Montpelier Food Pantry, working to support all of our other recipient organizations as they adapted and tried to find ways to get back on their feet and going to distribute food um, through their um, distributions. And some of those actually are just barely starting now. I mean, we've been doing this for the last almost a year, helping sites to get back to where they were before the flood in terms of the food distribution that we're doing. So some of the community meals that we're partnering with are just sort of getting back to um, 
creating their own meals versus getting meals from other sources and being, cre you know, having creative solutions. So we continue to support them in those efforts in addition to um, still feeling the effects of the season last year. So a lot of farmers, even if they weren't flooded, it was so wet that they were not able to produce the crops they normally would. So normally we would be seeing um, surplus from farmers from last season all the way through this spring into the summer and even into this coming fall. We're not gonna see any of those crops. So we are feeling those effects from the challenge season last year. And so trying to just be as creative as we can and finding other food sources, knowing that food pantries are also seeing those effects as well as all the other challenges that people might be having and needing to go to food shelves. So with a 30% increase at most of our food shelves that we work with, um, not having that extra food from last season is definitely definitely a challenge. Um, but, but generally we're working to, sorry, I gotta stay away from this a little too hot, <laughs> um, you know, responding, um, to whatever wasted food might be in the community is our way of working to make sure that we can be as resilient as possible and um, generally helps us um, make sure that people have the food that um, we know is available and just being that connector to help make that connection in the community. Um, so um, the work that we're doing um, is generally, um, I like think and talk at the same time, it's not working, <laughs> um, is, is helping the community to be more resilient, utilizing all the resources that we do have available um, and being as flexible about how we go about using those as possible. So. Thank you so much. <laughs> Teresa, do you want to stay where you are or you want to come up? All right. Teresa Marie Clausen is a community organizer and is batting cleanup. It is baseball season, right? Well, you do what you want to do. You ready? You ready for the microphone? All right. Because we haven't we haven't done it yet. He's hiding. He's hiding. This is John Copans. John Copans is the new executive director of the new commission that Katie referred to earlier, the Montpelier Commission of Recovery and Resilience. So, would you like to just say hi? Uh, I am fresh in the job. Uh, yeah. Started last week and uh, really. Uh, Looking forward to connecting with as many of you as possible. The commission's work is really very much about the community's work, and so it's going to take a team effort. And so really look forward to connecting. And I think most importantly, we have a public forum in this very space next Thursday from 6.30 to 8.30. We're going to be rolling out some more specific initiatives that the commission will be working on in partnership with you all. So. Uh, it's nice to meet you all. Look, look forward to more conversation, and thank you, Teresa. You're very welcome. I'm going to sit down. Um, yeah. Oh, I got. I'm. Uh, I heard. I got the message. I got the assignment. Um, so I, we're a little out of order because uh, my remarks tonight are going to be in support of Lalitha, um, and Lalitha and I have been driving around in my car. <laughs> this picture, me and Lalitha, for the last week. So I feel like. We're very bonded. Um, so I worked with Aletha and her save a work during the flood, um, or after the flood. Um, and I had a very different experience. Um, and I want to share that with you, because I think it's really important as a community that we understand all of the facets of resiliency and, and what can happen when that resiliency is challenged. So I want to thank the co-op uh, and I'm doing this, I, I wrote these remarks, one, because Nathan said five minutes. I was like, if I write it down, it's going to be five minutes. But also, the more I thought about this and the more I realized what I wanted to say, um, really needed uh, a more cohesive presentation. Um, and I have some statistics, too, in here that I want to share with you. So I decided this needed to be a little bit more formal. So I want to thank the co-op for convening and hosting this conversation. Mm -hmm for asking these germane questions, for the council's decision to explore how and when it might become more deeply and more relevantly involved in the community in which it thrives. I've lived in Montpelier for 30 years, worked here in various capacities, raised a family here, and have volunteered here, there, and everywhere, as many of you know. Um, I'm fairly certain that the reason for inviting me tonight is because the co-op and I have built a resilient relationship together that has benefited our terrific public school system, our vibrant local economic engine, 
our cultivation of creativity in the arts as necessities of community life, our concern for our natural environment and its food systems, and in some instances, work that was a combination of many of those things. Hunger Mountain Co-op has been an important and integral part of my volunteer work over the years, and I am incredibly grateful for its presence in our community. With the co-op support, I worked behind the scenes on Lalitha's volunteer save -a team, helping to secure food supplies that they prepared for community meals. I can answer the prompts that you have on your table based upon what I experienced with Lalitha's team. It's important to note that as a non-marginalized white person who is trying better to understand my role as an ally for marginalized people, that I am a work in progress. I don't have a lot of answers, and I am definitely part of the problem. But part of my work is to speak up for Lalitha and for all of those who were marginalized those first two weeks after the flood. So what is resiliency in a challenged environment? According to Lalitha's definition in, her, in the Border Town podcast, she said, we became one doing everything. It was really beautiful. And that was true until it wasn't. So I'll answer this question by describing what resiliency is not in a challenged environment. After the second day of Lalitha's Save a Team, providing food to flood volunteers and workers, she received what she was told by a community volunteer to be a city directive for her to request donations for her food or to direct people to the open local restaurants where they could pay for food. In particular, she was asked to post signs in Spanish directing flood workers, the majority of whom were Mexican nationals, to either donate or patronize a local restaurant and pay for their food. Obviously, this is not an example of resiliency in challenging times. At least, it is not resiliency for people of color. In this difficult time for Montpelier, when food became the focal point, Racism thinly disguised what we, as non-marginalized whites, consider to be capitalism, became readily apparent. What would it look like for our communities to become more resilient? There are many, many possible answers to this, but I'm only going to focus on two. Number one, understand systemic racism, and in particular, interrogate the relationship between racism and US capitalism, which treats labor as a commodity supported by a legal system that protects private property rights. This is part of what occurred during Lalitha's Save a Service. Systemic racism is made up of racist ideologies working across our institutions to exploit and deny the rights of people on the basis of race. Systemic in that all of our major social systems are impacted and are driven by it. And we, as non-marginalized whites, are the primary beneficiaries. Examples, in our economy, since the beginning of white European colonization, the systemic exploitation of black and Native Americans has fueled the economic development and prosperity of the United States. For every $100 in wealth held by white households, black households hold only $15. Black Americans currently own one-tenth of the wealth of white Americans, a racial wealth gap that would be, by some estimates, over 228 years to close. The 22% of Native American people who live on reservations legally cannot own their land because reservation land is held in trust by the US government. Without that asset to use as collateral, banks consider these borrowers high risk and provide unfavorable loan terms. In our healthcare system, BIPOC people suffered COVID deaths and long COVID, two and a half times the rate of whites. Black women suffer a maternal, mator, uh, maternal mator, mortality rate five and a half times greater than white women. Or what happened in Flint, Michigan with the water crisis. The people of Flint were so devalued that their lives were subordinated to the goals of your municipal fiscal solvency. In housing, the Minnesota, Minnesota's Attorney General just this month filed a suit against real estate broker and lenders for predatory lending and bias against Muslim buyers and sellers, causing them to lose their homes and thousands in savings. Black homeowners are almost 70% more likely to lose their homes in a foreclosure crisis than whites. And environmentally, the systemic exploitation of black and Native Americans to fuel US economic development and prosperity has spawned an environmental destruction. The US is now the world's second highest carbon emitter in the 21st century. The second point I wanted to raise is put in place, this is more specific to Montpelier, those were national and statistics, but 
to put in place a municipal structure designed to support marginalized people. If, it, if the city had put in place a civic structure, or if we had a civic structure that was a viable part of a comprehensive emergency management response system, whose primary responsibility would be to support our marginalized people, Lalitha may not have, been, may not have experienced what she now describes as a very traumatic few days, and our BIPOC paid flood workers would not have reported that they were not welcome to eat free food. And what is the co-op's role in weaving this fabric? Here are some concrete ideas that the co-op could consider. Help develop a strong community food safety net using existing partners and ensure that it becomes part of the city's master plan. Integrate Hunger Mountain Co-op into the city's or region's climate emergency management plan. Support partner, support or partner or lead year-round seasonal food-oriented community events or activities, perhaps by helping revive CANs, which are our capital area neighborhoods. Support marginalized people's goals of attaining more land, especially farmable land. Non-marginalized people, mostly white males, own 98% of private land in the United States, and in Vermont, 99% of the land is owned by whites. Investigate and participate in legislative efforts to fund the Vermont Land Access and Opportunity Board. That is ongoing work happening right now in our legislature. Actively recruit, which is code for go to where they are, marginalized peoples for the co-op board and for its employees. Get professional training to help review and change your policies and your workplace to attract these people. Know your local resources. There are over 120 BIPOC-led and social justice-oriented Vermont organizations, and dozens of them are affiliated with food. Work more collaboratively with other co-ops nationwide through your formal association memberships to support land reparation practices. And the last thing I would say is we cannot and will never be a truly resilient community if some benefit more due to the deprivation of others. Thank you. So, among other things, Katie Trout's is a musician and wishes for a brief encore. <laughs> no, no. Um, I just realized, and thank you, Teresa. I think like we should keep that in the front and continue our discussions this evening with that in the front. Uh, but I did want to mention that I, I spoke a lot about our recovery work, and I really didn't actually address um, the resilience work that we're getting involved with. And I just wanted to mention that the way I see resilience is knitting a tight, and it actually relates to what um, Teresa is saying, knitting a tight community. And that strong community fabric is where it all begins. Um, everything from the volunteers to the funding to the food, every aspect of what the hub was was, was community driven. And so I see Montpelier Alive's role and in collaboration with the co-op um, as trying to continue to find ways to knit that community fabric tightly um, that will allow us to do that work uh, going forward that is necessary um, and allow us to recover and bounce back quickly. So I just wanted to say that's how I see it and our work with events and with beautification and, um, and collaborative experiences with other entities is all centered around that. And I hope that we can improve upon that as a community, as an organization and um, I just think that's underlying a lot of this discussion. Thank you so much. OK, um, next up is you discussing amongst yourselves some of these ideas. And you should all have a playing card in front of you that I handed out earlier. <clears throat> and what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to move your seats so that you can build community by meeting people you may not already know. I'm assuming that many of you came here and sat with folks you know. So we're gonna start right here with the table behind me. If you have an ace, this is the table for aces. If you have a one, or a two rather, this is the table for twos. If you have a three, this is the table for threes. Four, right here. F right here. Five, right here in front of the main table. Six is over here by the windows. Seven is near the entry. Three, you are back there. All right, what am I up to? 
seven, six. Ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you have an eight, please come to this table right here. If you have a nine, come to the table where you raise your hand. That's table number nine. Table number 10 with Richard. Richard, nope. <laughs> yeah. uh, what do you have? Ten. Okay. So let's do king here. Let's do queen over here. And if you have a jack, let's do the jack over by the sink back here. You have a puzzle going? I'm so impressed. That's awesome. What card do you have? You're, you're a 10? What card do you have? Jack. 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 Jack, I believe, is over there. There. Okay, there. It says queen's here. Okay, once you get settled, I will be handing out, if there isn't already on your table, a yellow pad of post-its and some pens. I'll be handing out post-its and pens. As you generate ideas about resilience in our community, would one person at each table please act as the scribe, act as the writer of those ideas, and then in about 15 minutes or so, we will t ask you to take those post-its and put them on the posters in the front of the room near where Devora and Teresa are. Um, and then that's a way that we can share and get that information back to the council. So again, at every table, please use a scribe or someone to take note of the ideas. Must be over here. Folks, in four minutes, we're going to wrap up the discussions. Jess is going to announce the winners of the gift cards, and we will start to take the ideas and organize them up front. So, four minutes to go. Okay. Folks, I'm gonna ask for your attention. I've circulated to most of the tables. As I was listening during your discussions, I was trying to pull out themes and categories of your ideas. And what I've done is I've written those on posters over here by the window, if you can see where I am. And not, not all of your ideas may fit into these categories, and that's fine. But if you have your ideas on post-it notes and can come up and sort them into the appropriate category, that will be helpful for the council as they try to gather your ideas and think about the role of the co-op in resiliency. The categories that I wrote up here are organization, planning, access, facilities, rebuilding, infrastructure, basic needs, costs or barriers, inclusion and community, and then communication and information. And I'm sure that I have missed some, so feel free to just put post-its on the wall if they don't fit into the categories I've written down. And then I'm going to hand the mic over to Jess, who's going to tell us who won gift cards to the co-op. Susan Becker. You deserve it. We have another Susan, Susan Nevins. Susan Nevins. Carolyn Wood. Ridpath? Do you have any? Yeah. 
Richard Stout. Do we have a Richard Stout? Mayor Beth Domanski. Do we have a Mary Beth? Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And Fred Collins? Folks, thank you so much for coming this evening. It is seven o'clock, and if you are planning to leave at seven o'clock and you have a hot date or something exciting to do on Friday night at seven o'clock, feel free to take off. If you are deep in an interesting conversation, don't let us stop you. Please stay and enjoy the community you're forming. Thank you so much on the behalf of the co-op.